So let's talk about what's gaining success on the tabletop for the mightiest paragons and forsworn traitors of the knight households, with an overview of six strong army lists, three for chaos knights and three for imperial. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought we'd focus on knights, talk a bit about strong imperial and chaos knight armies in Warhammer 40k, and take a look at three real examples of each that have done well at big tournaments, and the army list that some top players chose to get them there. As I mentioned in the last video on the channel, both the Imperial and Chaos Knights are seeming pretty well balanced in Warhammer 40k right now, tournament win rates around about the 49% sort of mark, maybe not winning all that many big events at tournaments, but I'm not sure that's the end of the world really. By their very nature, they're kind of a skew list and a stat check sort of army, can the enemy force overcome the sheer amount of adamantium, ion shields and guns that you bring to the table, or can they not? Maybe a little bit less subtlety and clever tricks, though of course they still seem to be stronger and weaker army lists, and of course you can definitely play them well or badly. For the Imperials, they get their inbuilt hit and wound rerolls, feel no pain, and things like the Mysterious Guardian Warlord trait, or adding a bit more might there, and maybe Mysterious Guardian seems to be the most tempting of the enhancements, able to teleport around the board. They won't like excessive amounts of anti-tank, and maybe a little bit predictable compared with some. They perhaps like terrain even less than the Chaos Knights, given that they can't warp through walls for one CP. But overall do tend to be a big, dangerous and scary army, and people are clearly getting a lot of wins with them. Starting out with the Imperials for the army list, let's talk through the units that were chosen, and then take a look at some of the strongest data sheets. This first one was run to take fourth at really quite a big tournament, called the Iberian Open at the Vera, a player with their name recorded as OUX, managing to get really quite significantly far in the event, going 5 wins and just the 1 defeat, that 1 defeat was in the last round to Grey Knights that came second. This Noble Lance takes Canis Rex, the mighty Freeblade, and then pairs him with a whole bunch of Armagers, 5 Armager Warglaives with Meltagons on top, 5 Armager Helverins with Heavy Stubbers on top, and then for Imperial Agent support there's an Eversaur Assassin, and one small unit of Inquisitorial Henchmen. We'll talk through the data sheets in just a second, but Canis Rex just brings a massive amount of raw damage. The army just do well with the knightly rerolls, and Imperial Knights just in general tend to really like just some assassins or henchmen as allies, cheap units, some of them with lone operative protection to be able to do secondaries or more low investment stuff. In order before losing to the second place Grey Knights, they went through a force of Index Black Templars, Hypercrypt Necrons, Gladius Blood Angels, other Grey Knights, and some Eldari, so certainly challenged with a bunch of top armies there. Canis Rex is commonly considered to be the single strongest Titanic Knight at the moment, 435 points for a lot of might. The Questor is getting their 22 wounds at toughness 12 with their invulnerable save against range and the 6 plus feel no pain. Canis Rex is armed with the Laz Impulsor, which is the one where you can swap between a high intensity strength 14 damage 4 shot or a low intensity strength 7 damage 2 to clear out hordes, and backs that up with Freedom's Hand, a slightly boosted Paragon Gauntlet with strength 20, AP 3, and a crazy damage 9, a wound or two with that, and you've destroyed just about any heavy threat in the game, barring other super heavies. Canis Rex just comes with massively more damage than his peers though, he hits on a 2 plus natively, and gets sustained hits 1 on both 5s and 6s, which is kind of mad, it means that he winds up with more hits on average than he has attacks, never mind the fact that you get those inbuilt Lay Low the Tyrant rerolls, and a free battle tactic stratagem when you need it, which could potentially be command point rerolls if you needed to reroll charges or, say, failed invulnerable saves. Overall, he is just pretty immense, not too hard to see why he's being included in most knightly army lists right now, and so Hector getting out when he's slain is a genuine positive, might be helpful for objectives. Otherwise, for the knightly battle line, the Armage of Warglaive is a mainstay, 150 points for an objective control 8 fast moving little knight. The Armage of Warglaives are just very dangerous with that thermal spear with 2 shots at strength 12, AP 4, and damage D6, getting a massive melt of 4 within 12 inches. And that's just going to be super reliable at hitting and wounding the enemy with the Lay Low the Tyrant rerolls. The Chain Cleaver is similar general purpose against anything that's toughness 10 or less. Not too bad at going through things like Custodes or Heavy Infantry Terminators. He also gets sustained hits one on the charge, and Tank Shock's interesting enough if you need to add a little bit more melee might. Finally, and perhaps a particularly notable factor of that pass list were the Armager Helverins. 140 points, so a bit cheaper than the Warglaive. They tend to be a little bit lesser seen, maybe taken in smaller quantities to guard the home field. Their main weapon is two big auto cannons with strength 9, AP minus 1, and damage 3. 
though they get anti-fly 2 plus if they're in their deployment zone or on an objective. Not too bad to chip away at a little bit of volume fire, though the AP-1 can be very underwhelming against certain tough targets. Might be one to use the focus fire for Armager's stratagem that gives them extra AP. I feel like Helverins may be extra meta relevant at the moment though, they are quite a good counter to Katarn as they go. Anti-fly 2 plus means you stack a whole bunch of saves with them, it's not like they need high AP to take them out. If you could get all the Helverins focus firing in unison, then there's a good chance they kill a Katarn in a single round of shooting. Moving over to look at their spiky cousins, the Chaos Knights also seem to be maintaining a win rate around about 49%, two big tournament wins since the data slate, and a little bit more regular plays competitively versus the Imperials. A lot of their units and stat lines have the same positives and negatives. Perhaps the biggest overall change is that the Chaos Knights really could build big around Battleshock with those big debuffs within 12 inches. As mentioned, they have that walkthrough wall stratagem, which is pretty handy to get around terrain, particularly with melee war dogs. And far more so than the Imperials, it looks like the war dogs just aren't well balanced with the Titanic Knights. Most lists tend to take a heavy war dog skew. One list that I did notice that took at least one Titanic Knight though was this one by Jake Dardzinski, who used it to take fourth at Cascade Clash Major. Again, a seriously impressive achievement to get five wins and one loss there. Another really big tournament of over 100 players. This one's headed up by the jousting power of a Chaos Savastus Knight Lancer. Big invulnerable saves and just enormous melee and speed there. Five War Dog Brigands with the spears and the chain cannons and big firepower with havoc launchers. Four of the scary melee War Dog Carnivores with havoc launchers. And then, as is fairly common with Chaos Knights, some allied demons. Two units of three Nurglings and one Beast of Nurgle. The only loss was to an Imperial Knights army list. I believe it was the one that placed third at the event. For the Chaos Knights, two War Dogs do seem to stand out in dominating competitive builds. Despite the points increase, the War Dog Brigand's still here. Still just generally a very efficient and nasty gun turret. Hitting on a 2+, plus, spamming out 12 anti-infantry type shots with the Avenger Chain Cannon with Strength 6 and AP 1. And then the Demon Breath Spear, which is the Dark Mirror for the Imperial's Warglaive 1. These guys also get a nice AP boost, getting AP better by 1 if they target an enemy unit that's closest to them. That's really nice for the Chain Cannon in particular. And just in general, these guys are hard to go too far wrong with. Some good anti-tank, some good anti-infantry, fast and okay objective control. Really quite an easy unit to use, and they also can contribute Havoc launchers to a few pot shots against something trying to claim an objective. The other really commonly played Chaos Knight is the War Dog Carnivore. 140 points, which seems pretty cheap for the massive melee that this thing brings. I certainly rate it as one of their strongest units. These ones move extra fast at 14 inch movement, they're reliable at making combat, re-rolling the charge roll, and when they get to melee they get to choose between 6 attacks hitting on a 2 plus with the slaughter claw, strength 12, AP 3 and damage D6 plus 2 is horrific, or a big 12 attacks hitting on 2s with the reaper chain talon if they need to sweep down some infantry. These ones are utterly brutal for the melee damage for the points cost, and are often going to get the charge rather than the other way around. Again, they do really like that walkthrough war stratagem, and just pretty nice for getting the dread range out into the midboard, debuffing the enemy and causing battle shock tests. Tank shock's pretty brutal with anything with a slaughter claw as well. Heading up that list though was the Chaos Serastus Knight Lancer. These currently appear to be the Chaos Knights that are having the most competitive success that aren't war dogs, seemingly being taken in preference to the Rampager. The 4 plus invulnerable save in melee probably giving the edge. I wouldn't really say that the Rampager is that far behind. These guys get some nice stat line increases, a big 25 wounds, and they get a 14 inch move that's far faster than a Questorus. A tiny bit of shooting with the Shock Lance, though it's mainly about the melee. 5 attacks at strength 20, AP 3 and damage 8 is monstrous, hitting on 2s with Lance just in case you were worried about wounding the toughest stuff in the game. Or they can sweep on a nice anti-custodies and terminator sort of profile. These guys will also usually contribute 6 mortal wounds to proceeding if they charge in, getting the free tank shock each turn they charge. And they can potentially act as a buffing unit for war dogs if it's convenient. War dogs within 6 inches get the assault keyword on their weapons. That might be handy enough opportunistically if some brigands need to follow it up to get some lines of sight. In general though, this guy is just big, scary and dangerous, and perhaps most of all, fairly tough to enemy counterattacks. The 4 plus invulnerable save at range and melee without having to spend command points for Dread Bulwark, that really is quite a nice thing. Back to the Imperials and for our second list here, this one was the Cascade Clash 3rd place list. As mentioned, I believe it beat the above Chaos list. Apparently a close duel between the Lancers was big. It did lose a list early in the event I believe though, 
meaning that Adrian James went 5-1 with this one. Compared with the first Imperial Knight list, this is a lot more Titanic heavy. We've got Canis Rex again, a Knight Errant, and the Loyalist version of the Sevastus Knight Lancer. That one does kind of similar things to the Chaos one, but it gets those inbuilt rerolls, which is pretty massive for its damage output. The inbuilt feel no pain, and also the ability to give one Warglaive advance and charge each turn, which is handy enough. Otherwise, this one's going fairly heavy into melee with four Armager Warglaives with the Meltagons, plus a lone Kaladus Assassin, able to jump round the board and do secondary objectives. I'm not 100% sure what, if anything, is aims to hold the home field objective out of these guys. Might be a list that's pushing up the table for damage and trying to table if possible. As well as the Lancer, the Errant seems to be one of the other popular variants for Titanic Knights for the Loyalists. This one is the one with the really quite big and scary Thermal Cannon. 2d3 shots to 24 inches, strength 12, AP4 and damage d6 with a slightly hilarious Melter 6. If you fail a save against this thing within 12 inches, then you're absolutely going to feel it. This one went with the damage 3 sweep Thunderstrike Gauntlet, which again would be kind of good for killing things like Custodes, I guess. It gets a plus 1 to hit against the closest target, so you could have that Thermal Cannon hitting on a 2+, plus, and its Bondsman ability could help out the Warglaives with getting Assault and re-rolling Advance rolls. Looks like it's the night that you want if you've got big enemy heavies on the table that you think you're going to need big Melter Fire to try and take down. Focusing on the common allies for the Imperials for a second, the Caladus Assassin is pretty easy to include in most Imperial lists. 90 points for an annoying lone operative that can then go bounding around the table doing secondary objectives, investigating signals, cleansing things, and deploying teleport homers as necessary. She also ruins one enemy battle tactic stratagem, which could be nice to try and punish anything that could particularly hurt the Imperial Knights they're supporting and does at least have a fair amount of damage that could threaten Ali's infantry if she needs to go in and make some damage happen later in the game, and a reasonable enough chance of taking out a character from the midst of an enemy unit. Otherwise, the other most popular choice for knights is a squad of Imperial henchmen. 40 points for 4 models that are 2 wounds each is quite a nice little deal for a unit to be able to do grunt work for the households, they do get a couple of fun weapon profiles mixed in with the unit, but the main thing that they are is just a few bodies to either hide on a home field objective, or maybe put into strategic reserve or something, perhaps popping up at the edge of the board to do a secondary objective, or trying to push up to a safe midfield one to give your opponent an annoying unit to take down. I feel like one or two of these is rarely going to be a bad thing for an Imperial Knight army, just helps round them out a little bit. For our second Chaos Knight list, this one was run by Dick van der Haast, that was one of the Chaos Knight tournament wins, using it to take first at Alliance Open, going 5-0 at a medium-sized grand tournament of 45 players. This one is a fairly classic Wardog spam Chaos Knight list, so good enough to get an example of that, I guess. One Wardog Stalker, which you need to take as you need one with the character keywords to be your Warlord. This one takes the Demon Breath Spear, a Slaughter Claw, and Havoc Launcher, and then a big 5 Gun Turrets of Wardog Brigands with Havoc Launchers, and 5 Wardog Carnivores also with Havocs. This one goes really quite heavy on the Nurglings as well, 4 units of 3 of them, some good big field ball control from the start of the game, and still has some for either home field screening or deep striking for secondaries. In order it looks like this list beat the Astra Militarum, Tyranids, Inari, Orcs and then Custodes in the final round. A fair mix of factions there, a win against the Custodes is a fair achievement in the last round I think, particularly as you know it to be played by someone good. For Wardog focused lists, at least one Wardog Stalker tends to be a necessity. I feel like the data sheet really isn't bad either. It's the mixed roll Wardog Knight with either a Slaughter Claw or the Chain Talon, and then the Chain Cannon or Demon Breath Spear. Pretty flexible and might depend a little bit as to whether or not you want more help against heavies or infantry. I think I'd probably be more tempted by more Melter and the Slaughter Claw myself. It does get a bonus for picking on isolated models as well. If there's no other supporting units within 6 inches of its target, it gets plus 1 to the wound roll. Otherwise, kind of ubiquitous for allies in Chaos lists are the Nurglings. Despite GW raising the points by 5, they're still pretty much auto-include for Chaos Knight lists and plenty of other Chaos lists besides. Just cheap little somewhat annoying units to take down with their invulnerable save. They can't do primary objectives due to OC0, but they can infiltrate into the midfield to have board control and deep strike to do secondary objectives. And on top of that, they might be able to kill one or two light infantry with lethal hits and actually have a fairly good debuff rule. Units that are within 6 inches of them get a minus 1 to hit, which could absolutely be meaningful for things trying to kill the knights. I feel like 2 or 3 units in most Chaos Knight lists are rarely going to be a bad decision for that reason. 
back to the Imperials for the third list, and this was the one that won the tournament for the Imperial Knights since the data slate. Quite an unusual list played by a Matthew Doman, who used it to take first at Big Beef Beatdown, a smallish five round GT going undefeated. Again, it's a triple Titanic Knight, and this one's kind of interesting, and it takes the Serastus Knight Atropos, which I haven't really seen played all that much. I guess at least partly due to it being still the expensive Forge World Resin Knight, compared with the rest of them that are in plastic. One of them takes Mysterious Guardian to warp him around the board after the enemy's turn, and that could be big for getting some line of sight with its last cutter, or potentially a charge if you get lucky. They're all backed up by two Armager Warglaives who take Stubbers for a little bit more Horde clearance, and an Arbiter Helverin also with a Stubber. Then they go heavy on the Imperial Agents, a Calidus Assassin for jumping round the board, an Eversaur Assassin, and a squad of four Inquisitorial Henchmen. The Eversaur Assassin can scout forward, so could give you some mid-board presence, and be able to do first turn secondary objectives, perhaps. Plus it doesn't really hurt to have a little bit more anti-Horde in a night list like this, most of the knights are pretty good at killing heavy stuff, more so than chaff troops. In order, it looks like this one beat Eldari, then Votan at Death Guard, Hypercrypt Necrons, then Leagues of Votan again. I must admit, on paper, that looks like a very rough set of matchups there. Leagues of Votan are generally quite happy to see knights on the table, given the plus one to hit and wound they can put on all the titanic ones. And Necrons probably aren't really any better, given the amount of scary Katarn out there. It seems that the Atropos Knights weren't off to rise to the challenge though, and they are kind of an interesting data sheet, a knight that's basically tailor-made to try and take down enemy monsters' vehicles, and particularly titanic or towering units. It gets the Serastus chassis, faster moving and 25 wounds compared with the Quest Doris, and they attack with two different range profiles that they ideally want to be within 24 inches for, a last cutter that's kind of similar to the Laz Impulsor for the Preceptor and Canis Rex, and also a Graviton Singularity Cannon, some hefty Strength 16 and damage D6 plus 1 attacks there. In melee it gets 6 attacks with Strength 14, AP3 and damage 4, again with sustained hits once more there. They get plus 1 to hit if they're targeting monsters or vehicles, and plus 1 to wound if they're targeting Titanics, potentially Bondsman abilities, helping out Warglaives and things against Titanic or Towering as well. As another small advantage, they also get their invulnerable save in melee as well, so on a melee counter-attack, it can just be a little bit tougher than some. Kind of fun to see those guys doing well though. Maybe it feels like a night where you're kind of gambling on the enemy bringing a whole load of tough stuff to make it worthwhile. Finally, for the last of the Chaos Knight list, this third army was run by Craig Valvano, using it to take fourth at Palladium Games' Dumpster Fire GT. Again, going small and one at a sort of small mid-sized grand tournament of 31 players. This one's War Dog Spam with a big great unclean one twist, Fairly similar Wardog setups to the last one, a Stalker, 4 Brigands and 5 Carnivores, so drop 1 Brigand and 1 Carnivore from the last one, and they've all opted to take Stubbers as opposed to the Indirect Fire. A little bit of volume attacks at close range, I guess. Backing them up though is a fairly hefty amount of Nurgle allies, a great unclean one with a Bile Sword and a Plague Flail, 1 Beast of Nurgle and 4 units of 3 Nurglings. This one took a loss to Tyranid's Invasion Fleet round 2, but otherwise beat Orcs, Index Black Templars, World Eaters, and Chaos Marines in the last round. It's kind of fun to see a Great Unclean one on the table for the army. I feel like it is always maybe a little bit tempting with the Greater Demons with the option to put just yet another big scary threat on the table to go alongside the Knights. The Great Unclean one, I would say, is one of the Chaos Demons' most efficient data sheets right now. Now it got the points cost down all the way to 235 for all of the tough bulk that it has. It's got 20 wounds at toughness 12, with a 4 plus invulnerable save, and a 6 plus feel no pain, and given that ridiculous amount of toughness, he's probably going to be lower than all the other knights for the enemy's priority list, having a good chance just to waddle about the board doing what he pleases. He can be a bit of a menace in the mid board, with a whole bunch of AP2 attacks that are quite good at clearing enemy infantry between that flail and vomit. Might not be the worst thing in the world for an opportunistic overwatch, and then in close combat he strikes with his bile sword, a bunch of mid-strength attacks at strength 8, AP2 and damage D6 with lethal hits. Certainly not the most damage in the world, but given all that toughness, it's probably going to survive to fight multiple rounds. And he can debuff one enemy unit for minus one toughness, which occasionally the other knights might find really helpful. Kind of fun to see a big chunky green boy making a nuisance of himself here. It's not like his objective control is terrible either at 5, only a little bit less than the war dogs 8. In any case, there we have it, that's three top Chaos Knight army lists and three top Imperial Knight army lists. Both the factions kind of doing it okay, I'd say, for raw power. 
I still feel like there's a way to go with the Chaos Knights for army balance though. It is kind of disappointing not to see a single Desecrator, Rampager or Abominant on the table. For their actual unique kits, they're only using one of them in the War Dogs. In any case though, let me know your thoughts on the armies, and if you had any insights as to how they were played, feel free to mention them down in the comments below. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Auspets Tactics, or certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep these coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.